In 2003, NIDA and CSAT formed a collaboration in order to help bridge the gap between research and practice. The purpose was to translate and communicate the latest research to practitioners and to ensure excellence in patient care for all those with substance abuse disorders. The Novel Engagements in Care Symposia was a product of this interdisciplinary collaboration. In the following videos, you will hear researchers discuss the latest scientific developments in conjunction with practices that will facilitate and translate the implication of various studies into real-world environments. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here this morning to uh, talk to you about motivational incentives. So I've been working here at Johns Hopkins for uh, over 25 years. And uh, the CTN has given me a wonderful opportunity to get to know some of the treatment providers. But what I want to do this morning is to give you the background of the motivational incentives um, approach that I've been working with for all this time I've been at Hopkins. And now the exciting development, of course, is that I'm having more of an opportunity to share this kind of technology with you all, with um, other treatment providers and uh, things are really rolling along in terms of dissemination of this particular intervention. What I want to do is to talk about the background. Um, where did this idea come from? What's the rationale behind it? Why did we think that it might be a good idea in the first place? And then, um, as Dr. Katz did, to really provide you with the research support that um, is behind this. Because when we talk about evidence-based practices, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about treatments that have been studied in research laboratories and have been shown to be um, efficacious there. And uh, the research to practice initiative is more what you're going to be getting this afternoon in the workshop. So this is going to be about why we're doing what we're doing, and this afternoon you'll find out how to do it, how to implement it. Now reinforcement plays a really big part in drug abuse, and I think, I hope that one thing we can all agree on is that it plays a really big role in the whole problem of drug addiction because drugs themselves are hugely powerful reinforcers. That's really what they are. They're chemicals that come in and they hijack the normal systems of the body that are producing reinforcement when, when people eat, when they you know, sleep and drink and have sex and all those good things. So drugs hijack those systems and they, they provide um, this immediate and potent reinforcement that just creates this huge allure and I like to think of it as a magnet. It's, it's like this force out there that's drawing our clients um, back to the use of drugs no matter how uh, good their intentions might be at the moment to not use. And what that does is it creates what we all know about as clinical ambivalence, and Dr. Katz referred to this too, because you've got the magnet of the drugs over here pulling this way, and you've got the draw of abstinence pulling this other way. But the problem with abstinence is that the benefits of it are, are not nearly as immediate or as powerful as the benefits of those drugs, which, you, which are easy to take, which will give you immediate relief and immediate pleasure. So, the idea behind motivational incentives, in fact, well, just backing up a second. Uh, so what's the solution to this? We've got, what we're trying to do is to fight against these really potent immediate reinforcers, which are the drugs that are exerting this allure over the clients. And there are several different approaches that have been taken to enhancing the motivation for abstinence. And I thought it would be useful to point out what some of these approaches are. One of the most long-standing approaches in our field to um, enhancing motivation for abstinence is to wait until natural consequences take their course. When the problems associated with the drug addiction become so immediate and powerful in themselves that the client really decides it's time to stop. Those aversive consequences just get too potent. So that's one way, and that's a kind of traditional way that's been um, used. But some of the more recent methods are, are trying to um, shorten that process, okay, to try to have interventions that can enhance motivation before people have to actually get to that point of hitting bottom because that way we would avoid some of the more severe consequences of the drug addiction. Um, 
Another way that's been tried then to enhance the salience of the problems associated with drug abuse is confrontation. And that again is a kind of traditional approach where uh, kind of coming from the synanon and the therapeutic community or clients are confronted with the fact that, you know, you're a drug abuser, you're messing up your life, I'm going to tell you about all the problems that I see associated with this, and so forth. So that's one way. The other way, which is what Dr. Ball is going to be talking about, is trying to enhance the salience of problems, but in a more gentle fashion with motivational interviewing, pointing out um, the difficulties that people may or may not see very clearly in their own lives, but doing it in a more general kind of roundabout way. Would you say that's a good thing? <laughs> All right. Succinct definition. Succinct definition. So, and, and those, are, those are good ways. These are all ways that work. The way that I'm going to be talking about to enhance the uh, motivation for change is by trying to counteract the allure of the drug reinforcement by providing other tangible and immediate positive reinforcements for abstinence. So kind of try, kind of like fighting fire with fire. You've got your potent reinforcer as the drug over here and you're um, trying to, uh, your abstinence, uh, making abstinence a more salient, using incentives to make abstinence a more immediately attractive option. So the drugs provide immediate reinforcement, incentives can provide more immediate reinforcement for abstinence. And this is designed to address that ambivalence. Now the way that this is done is with um, a process that's called in general, calling, called contingency management. Um, I, use, I sort of use motivational incentives and contingency management synonymously. Contingency management is a more technical way to refer to these procedures. And the idea behind them then is to make abstinence a more attractive option through positive reinforcement of behavior change. Where did this idea come from? Well, actually, it came from this fellow. Um, this is Burris uh, Skinner, Fred, Fred Skinner, who uh, did his work back in the 1950s and really uh, revolutionized the whole field of psychology, in my opinion anyway, by discovering that behavior can be changed because behavior responds to the co its own consequences. This is the really important principle that Skinner discovered, that if behavior has a consequence in the environment, then people are going to repeat a po behavior that produces a positive consequence, and they're going to stop a behavior that leads to a punishing consequence. It's a very, very fundamental principle that turns out to have really profound um, implications for everybody's life and for the treatment of our, of our patients and our clients. Um, I think that we all recognize that rewards and punishments uh, really do operate naturally in our lives all the time. Um, you know that if, if, you, um, if your boss tells you that you've done a good job, that's going to make you feel good and want to make you do a better job tomorrow. And if your boss uh, has a sort of punishing attitude and only, only gives corrections and, uh, and tells you when you're doing things wrong, then that's going to make you feel bad and you're going to think about changing jobs probably. Uh, with children, of course, positive and negative consequences are used all the time. Um, and if you have children, I'm sure you know how that goes. The exciting thing, though, is that consequences can be harnessed to help people change behavior, and they can be harnessed in a very humanitarian kind of way. Sometimes when people think of contingency management, they think about manipulation and so forth, and I suppose it can work that way, but, on, but honestly, this is a, a powerful intervention for positive behavior change that can be um, harnessed in a very humanitarian and helpful kind of way. It wasn't too long after Skinner did his work with rats in an operant conditioning box where he showed that rats would press the bar if they got food and would stop pressing if they got electric shop. Soon after that, these kind of principles were harnessed for use with people. And one of the most interesting places where this, was, uh, this harnessing took place was in institutional settings where uh, schizophrenics and uh, mentally retarded folks were being treated in institutions. 
And the re I'm bringing this up because it's going to be relevant for some of the things that are going on in drug abuse uh, more recently. But these were systems developed called token economies for use in institutional settings. And basically what happened is that the patients in these settings were able to earn points for good behavior. And when I say good behavior, I'm talking about things like getting up on time in the morning, taking your shower, making your bed, getting to group on time, um, just all the routine things that, uh, that made the institution run smoothly. And if they did these things, then they, you know, the, cl the uh, counselors kept track of it, and the points could be traded in for goods and privileges. So they could go to the canteen and buy candy bars and sodas. And unfortunately, back in those days, they could also buy cigarettes, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, also, they could get privileges. They could get grounds passes, weekends passes, and so forth. Now, you probably recognize that, because it's still used in therapeutic communities, these kind of point systems, where if people um, you know, are cooperative with the house rules and do what they're supposed to do, then they, they get points and they can uh, use those to build toward their higher levels of functioning in the community. <coughs> Token economies, though, and I want to throw in an example that's not from um, an institutional setting because this is something that, that isn't confined to institutional settings or poorly, you know, low-functioning uh, people. These kind of programs have been adopted actually in business. And uh, I just love this example because it comes from the pharmaceutical industry. I was talking to a representative once at dinner, and she told me that this is what happened in her company, where uh, it was called Award Celebrating Ex Excellence, and they could earn coupons if they had um, high sales performance or if they did extra work, or their boss could even give them points for good enthusiasm toward their job. I just thought that was a great idea. <laughs> Well, when I got to Johns Hopkins um, back in the mid-70s, um, and I knew about Skinner's work, and I knew about token economies and the institutional settings, and I thought, why couldn't we apply these kind of principles to the treatment of drug abuse? And as my colleagues and I thought about this, we realized that, well, probably we could, because the two things that you need in order to apply contingency management are a target behavior that you can measure so you know whether or not it's happening or not, and some kind of a rewarding consequence. Keeping in mind, however, this little principle is that it's the link between the behavior and the ward reward that is critically important. Um, giving things away for free does not change behavior, and we'll be talking more about that this afternoon in the workshop. So at the time we were working in a methadone maintenance clinic, okay, that's a, the, an important context to remember. And we looked around and we said, okay, we need a behavioral target. What is it that clients, that we'd like to see them doing more of that they're not doing now? Well, one thing, well, there were lots of things actually, but one thing was attending their counseling. They didn't always uh, come to counseling the way we thought would be a good idea for them. And then we noticed that methadone clients tend to use extra drugs during treatment. Not such a good thing. Cocaine, cocaine in particular, was the big problem. Benzodiazepines, actually, back then, were even a bigger problem than they are now. So we said, okay, we got behavioral targets. What about incentives? Let's look around. What is it that clients might find desirable, sufficiently desirable, that they would be willing to change their behavior in order to get this? And we thought about several different things. The one thing that we came up with back at the beginning of this research that actually worked really pretty well was methadone take-homes. Um, how many are from methadone programs? Okay, a lot of you are from drug-free, it looks like. Well, you know, in methadone, the medication is taken seven days a week, and one of the things that clients find highly desirable is the opportunity to take doses home with them. It's quite an, um, a privilege. It's very much appreciated by the clients. And it's a very nice way, uh, thing, reward that can be used to acknowledge positive behavior change. So uh, we found out that the take-homes would be highly desired, and that would be a good reinforcer. And then we thought about money, and we dabbled in money. We didn't use money too much back in those days primarily because of the, um, the stigma attached with paying clients to do what they should be doing anyway. And we were kind of buying into that uh, philosophy back then, although that's come a long way, that attitude. So some of the really early research had to do with offering take-home incentives, 
for uh, doing something that was therapeutically appropriate. And counseling attendance is a really nice target for contingency management interventions. It's a simple <laughs> behavior. It's easily observed and easily tracked. You know if that, if that client is in the group or not. There's no uh, debates about whether this behavior happened or didn't happen. So what we did is we picked some patients who had poor attendance at counseling, and we offered them, um, in one study, early study, we offered them weekend take-home uh, dose if they came to their sessions. In a different study, we offered um, optional individual therapy with a take-home the day after the session if they attended. Now, both of the studies are shown here, and we've got Let's look at the one on your left first. That's the one with the required counseling. So we picked a group of people. When there were no take-homes offered, they went to about 40% of the scheduled sessions, okay? When they could earn those take-homes for the weekend, we saw that rate of attendance jump up to nearly 90%. Pretty impressive. And this was over about a three-month period, so it wasn't just a couple of times. We were very gratified to see results like this. Again, we picked a group of patients who were using benzos. So before the incentives, here you see um, during uh, three months before, three months during, and three months after the incentive program, the percent of benzo negative urines was less than 10% because we picked clients who were always using, you know, they were always coming up positive. And when we offered in this case, we offered a menu. This is another nice trick that you can use, is to give people a choice of what reinforcer they want. So they could get take-homes or they could get some money in this particular study. I think it was $30 a week back then, but this was years ago. So they could pick which they want, and they were sort of a 50-50 choice. Half of them took take-homes, half of them took money. But they could only get that, of course, if they came in with a negative urine negative for benzos. But you see we got those rates of negative benzo urines to jump up to 53%. And when we took the take-homes away again, when we, when we uh, terminated the intervention, um, unfortunately these folks all went back to their benzo use. So those were the early studies using take-homes. And methadone take-homes can be a pretty nice um, incentive. And we can talk some more about that in the workshop this afternoon if people are interested in um, making uh, better use of the take-homes in their program. One of the people that studied uh, in our laboratory, we have a postdoctoral training program, and it was mentioned that Liz Katz was in that program, and many others have been it, through it. And one of the people <coughs> who came through that program was named Steve Higgins, and Steve went up to the University of Vermont after he finished with us, and you know he had learned about take-home reinforcers and all those good things. And he went up to Vermont and um, decided that he wasn't going to be squeamish about using money as a reinforcer because, after all, money is the universal reinforcer. Who doesn't want to have more money? Maybe if you're a millionaire you don't, but most of the people that we know would like to have more money. So Steve came up with some pretty nifty um, interventions that I'll tell you about in a second. And it really revolutionized the field of motivational incentive research because now, now we had a reinforcer that was universally applicable. You can use money in any kind of setting. And um, as you'll see, it became very popular to do research with these kind of incentives. And research has been done now with cocaine abusers, alcoholics, marijuana abusers, and a whole variety of different substance, substances of abuse showing that these kind of interventions work very nicely. There's actually two different particular methodologies that have been used now. One is the vouchers developed by Higgins. The other is prizes um, that you keep on site in a cabinet. And that's the methodology that Dr. Petrie, our workshop leader, has developed. And I'm going to tell you about both of them because they both are quite effective. OK, so what are these vouchers? So what vouchers are, it's there, it's really a token economy. It's right back to what we talked about at the beginning. It's a point system where you earn points for good behavior and then those points can be converted into uh, tangible rewards. So the vouchers are earned for achieving therapeutic goals. For example, coming in with cocaine-free urines. That's a therapeutic goal, stopping cocaine use. Those vouchers are worth money 
And of course, the amount of money that they're worth can be adjusted depending on how much you have to work with. And then those vouchers are exchanged for retail items like clothing, sports equipment, um, gifts for your kids, whatever, or they can be used to pay the rent, pay your bills, or even pay clinic fees. Now, why, why use vouchers? The reason that they were used to begin with is because there was, there was still a concern about giving cash to drug abusers, and I'm sure you can all understand what that would be, because cash in hand often translates into drug, you know, in the vein or up your nose. So um, there was that concern, a sort of safety concern. And so the vouchers, w the point system was a way to get around that, to give goods and, goods and services rather than um, cash, per se. And actually, we haven't done the research that I'd like to see done to um, find out whether there really is a safety concern with giving cash um, as a reinforcer, because it would actually be a lot more convenient and easy to give cash rewards rather than these vouchers. With the vouchers, um, it takes quite a bit of staff effort because you've got to go out and purchase the goods that the clients want. So it's like a shopping service for your clients which is nice for them, but <laughs> it's uh, more work for the staff. So this is the kind of study that Dr. Higgins did to show that this voucher program um, was, was efficacious. <laughs> this was one of his early studies published in 1994. There were two groups in this study. <clears throat> Both of the groups, and this was in a drug-free outpatient clinic in Vermont with cocaine abusers, okay? So these are stimulant abusers. Now, everybody in this study got some very nice intensive psychosocial counseling. That was called the Community Reinforcement Approach to Therapy. In addition, everybody gave urines twice a week. You, you have to you do urine testing fairly frequently with incentives, especially uh, with short-acting drugs like cocaine, so you make sure to cover you know, the use and uh, test for abstinence frequently. And then they were randomly assigned either to have the voucher program or not. How much could they earn? These folks could earn a little over $1,000 during a three-month intervention if they were completely clean for cocaine that whole time. Now, in fact, in actuality, the average earnings was about $600. Uh, why do you think he's, he chose that amount of money, $1,000? I think it was because he wanted to make sure that this was going to be a potent intervention, that, this, that clients were going to stand up and take notice. A thousand dollars, wow, you know, who wouldn't want to work for that? And so I think that that was sort of an important feature of these early studies. He wanted to make sure that he did something that was sufficiently powerful that it was likely to work. And sure enough, it did work. So if we look at the retention through a six-month study, and remember this is no medications involved here, this is outpatient, 75% of these clients were retained in the study for uh, six months compared to about 30 to 40% in standard care. So that's a beautiful difference in retention and you know for with, with dropout being the key issue in outpatient drug free, this is a very remarkable finding. And it also was translated into cocaine abstinence that's the percent with more than eight weeks of continuous cocaine abstinence, and that was about, looks like 60% in the uh, incentive group and about 25% in the standard care. So these were very powerful interventions, um, remarkable findings. No one had seen results like this in the field of drug abuse. They're just huge effects. One question that needed to be answered, and uh, Dr. Higgins did answer it, is whether there was a, uh, any follow-up. Um, during follow-up, could you still see benefits of the incentive intervention in follow-up? Now remember, when I showed you that people went back to their benzo use in that early study, here though, there were two differences. One is that the program was in place for six full months. Also, there was some good psychosocial counseling going on as a background, so to help people ch make the behavior changes that could uh, produce lasting <coughs> effects. And indeed, Dr. Higgins has found lasting effects when he does one-year follow-up. He sees that there's a higher percentage of people who received incentives showing um, abstinence at one-year follow-up compared to those who were in standard care. So this is very encouraging findings. 
A lot of people took up Dr. Higgins' program and tried it in other populations. One important <laughs> piece of work was done here at Hopkins, asking whether this would work for cocaine-abusing methadone patients. This was a study by Dr. Ken Silverman, who works here at Hopkins. So this is now in the methadone cl clinic. And um, here we had everybody in the study giving urines three times a week, even a little bit more intensive than in Higgins, and being randomly assigned to receive vouchers if their urine samples were cocaine <laughs> negative versus a different kind of a control where, where the uh, control patients received excuse me, receive these vouchers regardless of their urine test results. This is a kind of um, stringent control to make sure that it isn't just receiving the benefits of the vouchers that are causing, helping people to stay off drugs. It really speaks to this issue that I raised before where it's the contingency, the link between being abstinent and getting the reward that's important rather than just the idea of getting um, benefits and being able to pay your bills and so forth. So again, there was over $1,000 available during the three-month study. And how did this come out? Now, in methadone, retention is not such an issue because the methadone itself is uh, a good reinforcer. We don't have to worry about early dropout. So there were no differences on retention between the group that got the contingent and the non-contingent incentives. However, when you look at cocaine abstinence, look at the difference there. The standard care, and by the way, these clients were chosen for the study because they showed evidence of cocaine use. That's why you're seeing no improvement, essentially, on the cocaine use of the control patients, even though they were getting vouchers non-contingently. And about 50% of those who received the contingent vouchers stopped using their cocaine for long periods of time. So again, very powerful um, and impressive results. One of the interesting things that Dr. Silverman did in that study I just showed you is that he asked the clients after the end of the study what they thought about it. And uh, they rated the incentives as more helpful than the standard care. So that was nice to see, overall helpfulness of treatment. Another thing that was really interesting here is that um, their attribution to why they stopped using their cocaine had more to do with their own willpower rather than attributing the behavior change to those external reinforcers. And we thought that was kind of interesting, that they were internalizing their own behavior change rather than attributing it to those um, external reinforcers. This is just another example of a study that's been done with a very different kind of substance abuse. This is marijuana, uh, patients coming in with marijuana dependence in an outpatient drug-free setting. Uh, showing that those who just received uh, some motivational counseling uh, did very poorly, actually. Uh, skills building counseling didn't do much better. But if you added some voucher incentives for marijuana-free urines in this case, um, the results were very, very good, 45%, with six weeks or more of continuous abstinence. So again, I could, sh I could go on for quite some time showing you a variety of studies where showing that these motivational incentives have very powerful um, beneficial effects when they're applied to a number of clients. One of the big issues, though, has to do with this $1,000. I mean, when we took this idea to the CTN, for example, and the researchers were saying, and you know, OK, so everybody agreed we should do something in CTN that had to do with incentives. but. The researchers were saying, well, OK, so we'll offer everybody $1,000 to stop their drug use. <laughs> and the clinicians, their mouths fell open. And they said, no way. <laughs> that, you know, There's no way that we could ever do anything remotely like this in our clinics. And so this has been a learning experience on both sides. The uh, researchers have learned uh, to deal a little better with the clinical realities. And one of the people who's been really the best at thinking through these kind of issues is Dr. Petrie, who's going to be our workshop leader this afternoon, uh, from friend and colleague from the University of um, Yukon, University of Connecticut. And what Nancy did is, is to think about the issue of whether the cost of these programs could be lowered while still retaining their efficacy. And the study, the example that I'm going to show you, uh, one of her earlier studies, 
was actually done with alcohol dependent patients in an outpatient drug free setting where there was a simple study, random assignment to receive standard care or standard care with incentive treatment. And it was a kind of ordinary uh, kind of standard care, intensive outpatient, eight week program, 12 step relapse prevention and so forth with regular breath alcohol monitoring. But here was the trick. This is what Nancy has uh, invented. She's invented the fishbowl. And what it is, is it's a fishbowl. It's a bowl full of little tickets. And um, those tickets have different things written on them. And what you, if you come in with a drug negative urine, what you get is a chance to draw from the fishbowl, draw some tickets from the fishbowl. Now, half of the tickets in there uh, aren't, don't have any prizes connected to them at all. So there's only a 50% chance of drawing any kind of a winner from this fishbowl. And most of the time, if you do draw a winner, it's only going to be worth a dollar. So, so this really reduces the cost by having most of the winners be these small amounts of, you know, worth small amounts of money. A few of them, one in 16 in this particular study, are worth prizes that are worth about $20. And then every once in a while, somebody draws the big winner, which is the jumbo ticket. And that's worth about $100. So that would be like a VCR or a TV set or something like that. And Nancy claims that having the jumbo prize in there is really important, that it really keeps people's interest uh, very perked, perked up. So draws were awarded from this fishbowl if people came in negative for alcohol and meeting their treatment goals. Let me see here. These were some of the prizes that were available. The little prizes are like toiletries or sodas and candy bars, things like that. The medium prizes are CDs and cordless phones and things like that. And the jumbo prize is uh, TVs. And, and, and those prizes, by the way, are kept on site in a cabinet so that the patients can get, have them immediately. And that helps, too. That helps to make the prizes more salient because they're right there. They can be seen. They can be touched and people can walk off with them, hopefully after they've come in with their negative. <laughs> <laughs> and you do want to have a lock on that door. <laughs> <laughs> so this is retention of the alcoholics in the outpatient drug-free treatment. You can see that retention was uh, very, very much better with the contingency management uh, incentive program than it was in standard care. Very important outcome. And here's the time to the first heavy drinking <coughs> episode. Again, significantly better for the, uh, those who were earning incentives than those who were in standard care. So this is what you learn how to do this afternoon, is how to make a fishbowl. And here's another, another kind of interesting uh, feature from this study. One thing that you may have noticed as I've talked about these studies is that they only target a single drug, okay? So the cocaine studies are targeting cocaine, the marijuana study is targeting marijuana, this alcohol study is targeting breath alcohol readings. Now, the researchers have done it that way because um, I think to make, uh, to make it simpler to understand what had happened and also to make it easier for the clients. But when we got into CTN and talked about this, the clinicians weren't too excited about only targeting the single drug. Because, of course, what you would like to see is your clients being negative for all the drugs that they might be abusing. Cocaine, opiates, marijuana, da da da. But let me just show you this, because this is really interesting. This is the study where alcohol was the target. And what you're seeing here is the percent who were positive for any illicit drug. At intake, the two groups were the same. But while they were earning their incentives for being negative on alcohol, look what happened to their other drug use. It went down, didn't it? There's way less drug use for those earning incentives for alcohol. And this is something that we've tended to see in all the studies. If you target a single drug and give incentives for being negative on that drug, you tend to see reductions in the other drugs of abuse, which is a very nice side benefit. And so this is the way that we actually recommend doing these pr procedures uh, is to target the single drug. Because um, if you start targeting all the drugs, it makes it very much harder and more formidable um, for the clients, especially those who are using more than one drug. So um, the fishbowl drawing method was a very nice innovation that could significantly reduce the cost. 
In that alcohol study, the subjects earned on the average only 200 worth of prizes. And that's way less than was done with the voucher programs. Um, Dr. Petrie has also uh, thought about other ways of reducing the cost of these prizes, such as going out and getting donations from local retailers. Uh, that's, that's one type of solution. Um, you, it still requires some staff effort to do that. Another one of her ideas, though, that I'll, I'm going to give away all your secrets here before this afternoon, but <laughs> is, is having like white elephant sale and having staff bring in uh, some of their unused or lightly used items that can be given as prizes. So um, basically what I've showed you this morning is that research studies have tested incentives for their ability to improve drug abuse treatment outcomes and really shown that they work. Not only do they work, but they're very powerful uh, motivators of behavior change. <coughs> so it's something that is definitely constitutes an evidence-based treatment and where we are now is trying to work on ways to make them even more user-friendly and able to be adopted by community treatment programs. Um, I just want to put up one more slide before I start, stop because it's something to think about when you're, when you're thinking about the advantages <clears throat> and the co costs and benefits of using motivational incentive programs. Um, and I think you'll get a better idea about this if you come to the workshop this afternoon, but there's some really nice <coughs> side benefits to these incentive programs. For one thing, they clarify expectations because you really have to be very clear and explicit with the clients exactly what it is that you want them to do in order to earn these, these rewards and prizes. So that's one side benefit. Um, at that same time, it adds structures to the consequences because there often are consequences, but sometimes they're sort of vague. You know, If you screw up long enough, you're going to be kicked out of the program, that type of thing. This makes the consequences more immediate and the whole, the whole therapeutic process becomes more structured. <coughs> um, it shifts the focus away from punishment and allows you to celebrate success, even if it's small steps of success. And I think that's a really important um, shift that, that is very pos has very positive side benefits for the clinic as a whole, for the counseling staff, for the clients, for everybody. It gives the patients a reason to abstain and it allows um, you to establish a culture in your, cl your clinic of celebrating success. So thank you very much. And now I think we can have a break.